Hi everyone! Today we're going to learn about plant propagation. This is the process of creating new plants, either through seeds or by taking cuttings of a plant and making clones. We're going to learn about different plant propagation methods. After today's lecture, you'll be able to be able to explain asexual versus sexual propagation, including the pros and cons of both. You'll also be able to list the importance of genetic diversity and define plant breeding and genetic modification. You'll also learn about why Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize, and you'll be able to compare asexual propagation techniques and their uses. Reproduction, we're going to cover two main parts of reproduction today. Sexual, which involves seeds that result from the union of sperm and egg cells, and vegetative, which is using parts of existing plants to generate new plants. Vegetative propagation is usually faster, but the Organisms that you're producing, the new plants that you're producing, are genetically identical to the parent plant. Sexual reproduction is used extensively, and the new plants you're creating are genetically distinct. As we just said, asexual propagation is creating a clone. What's the danger of that? Well, if you're creating a clone for, say, strawberries, you're creating many different strawberries from a parent plant. If that parent plant happens to be susceptible to a disease, then the whole population of those strawberries will be taken out. If there's genetic diversity through seed production, however, those plants, some will be susceptible, but some will be resistant. So using clones should be done carefully. Just like there's genetic variation between you and your siblings, or if you don't have siblings, you and your cousins. This genetic diversity makes individuals unique and the same thing for plants. Some plants are resistant to different pathogens or might be more drought tolerant, just like you might have different skills and talents than your siblings. Gregor Mendel was very interested in genetic variation, and he did research on pea plants. Mendel was curious about how traits were transferred from one generation to the next, so he looked at different pea plants and found genetic variation, such as flower color, um, seed size, and seed um, orientation, either wrinkled or round. He created an experimental garden to understand hybridization, the process of combining different varieties of organisms. So he he crossed these two plants, he did research. Let's look what happened when he crossed purple flowers, pea plants with purple flowers, with pea plants with white flowers. When he crossed these two, all the plants in this first generation, which is called the F1 generation, which is high, also called a hybrid, all of these plants were purple. Once he crossed the purple, these purple plants to um, the other purple plants within this group, the F1, he got mostly purple, but some white flowered plants. We'll look on the next slide about why this is. Because the gene for purple flowers is dominant, this was showed in all the F1 population. But when you cross these, um, one fourth of the time you got the white plants again. If you cross these purple plants that had both dominant traits, um, uh, both dominant alleles, you got more all purple plants. But if you cross these two, you got the same three to one ratio. If you cross these white um, plants, you would get all white. Now we're going to move on to asexual propagation. This is an exact clone. This is really good if you're wanting to preserve a desirable characteristic that could be lost in sexual reproduction. If you cross a plant to another plant, or even a um, plant that looks like quite similar, the plants might not be exactly the color that you're looking for, um, or the exact taste. So if you want to exactly make a clone of the plant, you will use asexual propagation. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, um, through seedlings, may resemble the parent, plant but may not be exactly like it, such as different tastes or different coloring or different size. A result of genetic recombination of the male and female gametes is this genetic diversity. Gene mixing will result in offspring with a variety of traits. This is because of this process that we see here, genetic recombination. This happens through sexual, this happens through sexual repro reproduction. So how do I decide how to propagate a specific plant? Well, it depends on how easy it is to germinate that specific plant, the number of plants that you want to grow, and the importance 
for you to preserve a specific trait possessed by the parent plant. Seed formation can be formed as a result of a plant fertilizing itself through self-pollination or being fertilized by another plant. This is called cross-pollination. Offspring resulting from a cross-pollination, so two distinct parents, are called hybrids and carry the traits of both parents. A seed package uh, bearing the word hybrid indicates the seeds are a result of a specific breeding technique where they use two different plants as the male and female. Selected hybrid seeds produce healthier, faster growing plants, and this is a phenomenon called hybrid vigor. We'll see this in the next slide. Hybrid seeds result from controlled crossing of two groups of plants of known genetic makeup. One designated the female line, the other the male line. Crossing two genetically pure lines can produce seeds with the best traits of both parents, again called hybrid vigor. So this is an example in corn. You have the parent plant and parent two. If you cross them, you get an F1 hybrid. So you can see that this plant is taller and it also has a larger corn cob, higher yielding. So this is a result of a hybrid. So if you buy hybrid seeds, can you replant them? Not exactly. Because these two different peer lines, parent one and parent two, are crossed to create a hybrid, if you, again, plant these seeds, you will have genetic variation. So you don't want to replant hybrid seeds. And sometimes the seeds are protected um, under patent, and that would be illegal to replant those. Plant breeders are people who select superior parent plants and make crosses to improve the genetics of the plant, with the potential to increase a crop's yield, taste, nutrition, efficiency, and resistance to pests and pathogens, or increase drought tolerance, um, specific um, nutrients in that plant, um, and other traits such as protein content. So plant breeders, again, are scientists who work to improve plant genetics. Norman Borlaug is a famous wheat breeder who developed wheat that is shorter in stature and resistant to an important wheat disease called stem rust. He saved over a billion people by his work in wheat genetics. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize for this work. He worked with policy leaders and government agencies in different countries to get his wheat available to the farmers who needed it most. He also did training for young people and farmers alike. He is known as a hunger fighter because he increased food security in the world. Watch this video to learn more about Norman Borlaug's legacy. So Norman Borlaug was a plant breeder. We're going to learn about genetic modified organisms now. This is a specific type of plant breeding that specifically edits portions of the DNA. Let's review DNA. So DNA is our genetic makeup of humans, plants, animals, etc. DNA is, through transcription, converted to RNA. And then through translation, is that, so those are created, turned into proteins. So DNA, then you have this transcript, you translate it into these proteins that are the building blocks of life. So if you modify the DNA, you will then modify this RNA, and therefore the proteins. So GMOs are the products of a specific type of plant breeding where precise changes are made to a plant's DNA to give it characteristics that cannot be achieved through traditional plant breeding methods. That means the gene might not be in the gene pool or it's very difficult to um, get that trait in the plant that you that you want it to be in. Traits that you can um, have added through GMO technology is insect resistance, herbicide resistance, drought tolerance, disease resistance, and increased shelf life. GMOs are quite controversial, so you want to do your own research about GMOs. GMO technology, however, has really helped horticulturists and agronomists in plant, the plant breeding sector because they're able to do this precise changes within the DNA. And there's many different techniques of genetic modification that you can also study. Now we're going to switch over to asexual propagation or vegetative propagation or the production of clones. All of these words can be used synonymously. So vegetative propagation. This could be done in a relatively short amount of time to produce a new plant. A cutting can be rooted in as little as two weeks so you can create a new plant quite rapidly. Cuttings, vegetative plant parts such as leaves, stems, 
or roots that regenerate missing parts to form new plants. They are cut from parent plants called stock plants. So these stock plants, you take a cutting of them and you create a new whole plant. So why do these cuttings work? If you cut off a part of uh, a human or an animal, it doesn't grow back the whole, the whole organism. But plants have what's called totempotency. Totempotency is the genetic potential of plant cells to produce the entire plants. In other words, totempotency is the cell characteristic in which the potential for forming all the cell types in the adult organism is retained in each cell. So for example, a stem cell can become a root cell or a leaf cell. These are some pictures of coleus cuttings. You can see that these cuttings were taken and then root are going to develop and then you then transfer them into soil media. So let's talk about tricks for making cuttings. When you cut off a part of a plant, it creates a lot of stress for that new cutting because it is no longer attached to the parent plant that is helping it produce um, all of the uh, building blocks of life that it needs, including the xylem is cut off so they no longer have water flow or sugar flow. So to reduce the stress on the plant, because it no longer has um, as much water being um, pushed through it, you can put these cuttings in a humid chamber to minimize transpiration. And this can be easily done with a light translucent storage box. Um, you can also just cover it with plastic if you just have a little, make a little dome um, if you don't have a storage box. You'll also want to choose a good growing medium that will drain quickly, but ensure that the um, plant does all, also does have enough moisture. You don't want the new cuttings to rot, so you don't want it to be too moist. Many combinations can be used for making a growing medium, such as sand, peat moss, perlite, vermiculite. Um, you can mix these to make your own uh, growing medium. Here's some additional resources that you um, may find helpful for cuttings. So we're going to talk briefly about hardwood cuttings. Um, so we're going to talk about hardwood cuttings. Hardwood cuttings should be taken to late fall through early spring from the mature wood of the past season's growth. So not old, old wood, but just from the past season's growth. Hardwood cuttings um, should be around 9 inches tall. You want 3 inches at the top and then 6 inches um, you want to put these in a shaded area. This is again to reduce transpiration. Semi-hardwood cuttings are taken in summer from particular partially matured new growth of woody plants. Um, cuttings can be made three to six inches long because they lose water through their leaves very rapidly. Cuttings should be placed in a pre-moistened plastic bag as they're cut. Um, procedure for rooting is the same for the hardwood cuttings, but rooting is often more rapid in semi-hardwood cuttings. For softwood cuttings, these ones should be taken in late spring from succulent new growth produced that season. They generally root more consistently and quicker than either hardwood or semi-hardwood cuttings. Um, picking the cuttings at the right stage of maturity is crucial to success, so you'll want to go back to those resources um, slide that I gave you if you're interested in doing these. Herbaceous cuttings can be taken and rooted any time during the year, such as the coleus is an example. Generally two to four inches long, taken from the tip of the stem. As with all cuttings, bases should be planted in a damp rooting media, and the cuttings should be enclosed in a plastic bag to increase humidity. Um, keep the cuttings wet from the time they are cut until they are stuck into the medium will do, reduce wilting. So lots of different types of cuttings that you can do. Um, cuttings of indoor plants can be of four types, um, depending on the part of plant from which they're taken. So you can have the tip stem cutting, um, subterminal stem cutting, leaf bud cutting, um, or a, just a leaf cutting. Um, you can also have a root cutting. Only specific types of plants um, will generate stems from roots. A plant that is great to get you started in doing leaf cuttings is African violet plants. Um, they root very easily. You can use rooting hormone or you can just not use rooting hormone. So this is if you take a cut right here, take this leaf, put it in this growing medium, you'll have a whole new plant generation. And again, that's because of the totem potency of plants. Some hormones are used to increase the speed of cuttings, um, or some plants you can't um, produce um, successful cuttings unless you use hormones. So auxin is going to stimulate adventitious root formation on stem cuttings, very important. IBA is the most commonly used, NAA is also frequently used. 
and then 240 is not um, commonly used. You can also use a cytokinin to stimulate adventitious shoot formation on leaf or root cuttings. Um, Kinetin is the most commonly used, but there's other options as well. So auxin for roots and cytokinin for stimulating shoot production. And then another type of asexual reproduction that you can do is crown division. This is great on hostas or aloe vera plants. Um, and this crown division is by cutting through here. In hostas, you just cut through um, the big root ball after you dig it up. By cutting through the crown with a spade, it's broken into several sections. This is a very common and reliable home propagation method that you can use. Some additional information on crown division. Shrubs can be divided um, but must be multi-stem. So you, if the plant has multiple stems and different roots growing from those stems, you can um, separate them. Division can be done any time in the growing season. Um, however, plants in active growth must be treated carefully because they're going to be um, transpiring and losing a lot of water, so you want to make sure that they uh, you're watering them often or keeping them in the shade. They should be divided when the plant is dormant because then you don't have this additional stress from transpiration. Part of the parent crown can be left um, to rejuvenate the shrub. So this is very common in hostas. You'll see people digging them up, giving away a lot of the different um, daughter plants to their neighbors, but they'll also have the hostas um, continue growing in that specific area. Another really cool technique is called layering. So what you do is you take um, from usually a bush um, of low flexible shoot and you bend it over and then somehow um, attach it to the soil, either by placing a rock here or a wire, that wire, and it's mounted and then you um, make a little pile of soil over it. And within a few months, roots should have formed on the covered portion of the stem and um, these daughter plants can be cut off um, and transplanted. This can also be done through a similar technique, which is air layering. So this technique is really common on rubber plants that have multiple stems and you want to start a new plant. If you just cut off to do a stem cutting on that rubber plant, it usually would not grow because that's a lot of stress on the plant. But air laying is a technique to get around that. Um, and it involves inducing rooting on part of that stem. So what you do, as shown in this picture, is that you cut um, this small area, usually around one inch, of um, the bark off the rubber tree, or um, just simply harm the, um, the tree right there. And then you're going to put moist soil around there. Um, yeah, so this removes the phloem, but not the xylem when you um, remove the bark. You place a handful or two of damp medium soil um, over this area and wrap it with plastic, securing up with twisty ties both ends. Um, you're sealing in the moisture there. And then you're going to place foil over it because these newly forming roots do not need light. So you want to um, put foil to prevent light to getting in and overheating. And in two to three months, um, several roots with the lengths of two to three inches will have formed. And then you can cut off um, and start this whole new plant and transplant it. So air laying is a really cool technique. A lot of vegetative propagation is also through runners, rhizomes, and stolons. And this is a way that plants are naturally trying to spread or reproduce. So runners, rhizomes, and stolons are horizontal stems produced as a natural means of vegetative reproduction. Runners grow above grounds, ground, and some examples of plants with runners are strawberries, ferns, spider plants, and strawberries, uh, and begonias. Rhizomes and stolons grow um, at ground level or below ground, and typically found on bamboo, grasses, and some irises. Um, as these modified stems, these organs have buds, nodes, and inner nodes. So again, we see this picture of the strawberry, and this, this is a runner. Some plants also have suckers and offsets. Suckers and offsets are young shoots that grow from the roots or stem of the mature plant, found in many shrubs and houseplants, um, and cactus. So you can just um, carefully using a glove, remove these and start a whole new plant. Next, we're going to briefly talk about grafting and budding. So this is a technique that you can um, basically put two um, plants that are similar but genetically different and bring them together to create a new unique plant. 
So again, unite, you're uniting genetically different plants so they heal together and function as a single plant. This is, can be really cool. A budding is transferring a bud of one plant to another that will function as the root system, whereas grafting attaches a small branch to another plant. It's most frequently combining two cultivars of a specific species into one plant that exhibits the best features of each. So you're taking the best of both worlds. Oftentimes you'll take a plant that is um, very drought tolerant and tolerant to that soil in that area, tolerant to the pathogens that grow in that area in the soil, and then you're putting a, a plant on top of it that has um, great taste or um, is very aesthetically pleasing. Grafting can also serve other purposes such as creation of unusual plants, um, plant forms such as tree roses or trees with weeping heads atop a straight strong uh, trunk so you can kind of create your own, be creative with um, grafting. Uh, you can also, if you have an older orchard, you can uh, graft on a newer variety onto that orchard trees. A new, new cultivar. Grafting and bunny rely on the activity of cambium cells um, and must be done when these cells are actively dividing um, so that this will heal together so that the xylem and the phloem um, will basically become one and, and heal as, as one plant. So the plant that's on the bottom is called the rootstock and the one on the top is called the cyan. So the rootstock diameter must be larger than the cyan. Uh, cyan wood is usually a pencil thickness or slightly larger. Cambium of the stalk and cyan must be in contact, so you want maximum surface area of these two coming together so they will heal. If contact isn't made, the graft won't heal and the cyan dies. The stalk and cyan must fit together tightly and the joint must be protected from drying out. So we'll go over how you can prevent drying out. Um, a, traf a tight graft union is achieved by wrapping the area with um, a rubber tie or a wax string. Drying is prevented um, by a coating of wax. So there's a few ways that you can prevent that from drying out. Another way that scientists use to propagate plants is through tissue culture. So if you have a really spe special type of plant and you want to make more of them, you can actually, because plants have toad and potency, from just a few cells you can generate a whole new plant. And this is done, um, this tissue culture is done if there is a plant that has a disease issue, you can create completely um, disease-free plants. Um, tissue culture is also called micropropagation is the, and is the propagation of plants um, nearly from nearly microscopic portions of the parent plant. Some advantages of um, tissue culture, again, is that it enables mass production of a cultivar from extremely limited amount of parent stock in a relatively small area, and it can eliminate disease-causing viruses uh, or bacteria or fungi from the parent material unattainable through the use of pesticides, and um, you're able to produce numerous virus-free offspring that are healthy and vigorous. So overall today we talked about asexual and sexual propagation, gave examples of both, we learned about the importance of genetic variation, we discussed plant breeding and plant genetic modification, we also learned about Norman Borlaug, and we learned about a few asexual propagation techniques and their uses. I hope this was helpful and I hope you have a great day. See you next time.